is a deadly foe, a relentless enemy that never sleeps. Every sailor knows this in his bones. But when the sea floods inland, the consequences are as terrible and totally unexpected. This is the story of a forgotten tragedy. The story of one night nearly 50 years ago, when weather and tide made a deadly coupling and brought tragedy to a thousand miles of Britain's coastline. It was the worst disaster of post-war Britain. Everybody loves a sea view, the calming murmur of the waves, the dependable rise and fall of the tide. From land, the sea is reassuring and tame. Our coastline is the place for holidays and retirement, and that is as true today as it was in 1953. January the 31st, 1953 was a Saturday. Like every Saturday morning, the British rail car ferry Princess Victoria slipped out of Stranraer in Scotland, heading across the Irish Sea to Larne. Severe gale for southwesterly winds as the morning weather bulletin gave the first hint of what was to come, only sailors took notice. Winds of up to 125 miles an hour began to sweep across the Irish Sea, whipping up waves 60 feet high. It was into the teeth of this storm that the Princess Victoria sailed. Among the crew was able seaman Alex Craig. He was used to the Irish Sea, and at first it seemed like a normal January crossing. There's a bit of a sea, it was blowy a bit, uh, you come out of uh, Loch Ryan, you know, but nothing to speak of. It wasn't until we got outside, got in the open sea. That's where it really, really started. Viking. Northerly 6 to Gale 8. An hour into the sailing, the Princess Victoria was in trouble. Her car decks were filling with water and she was listing badly. It's hard to describe what like the weather was. It was a nightmare. I never saw anything like it. The heavy sea come and just burst, burst out of the door and couldn't do a thing about it. The women and children were the first priority to get away. They got into this lifeboat. But once they got out into the open sea, the heavy winds, this, uh, the heavy winds just blew them right back up against the side of the ship. Alex and his fellow crew could only stand by and watch helplessly as all the women and children were drowned. At one o'clock on Saturday afternoon, the final message ever heard from the Princess Victoria was relayed to Larne. Made it. Mayday, we are preparing to abandon ship. When I saw a, a lifeboat capsized, I didn't expect to survive. It was only by chance but I jumped off the side. And uh, when I jumped, this wee lifeboat was down at the bottom. That's how I got away. 133 people lost their lives. 46 years later, Alex Craig is one of a handful left who still remember the first victims of that tragic weekend. But tragedies at sea are not rare in Britain. Every winter, stormy seas claim the lives of fishermen and sailors. What was different that weekend was the way the sea turned and took more lives on land than it did at sea. For weather and tide together created a rare but devastating maritime monster, the storm surge. A storm surge is a meteorological phenomenon which is created by low pressure passing over a, a body of water. It's important to understand the, how the, the ocean interacts with the atmosphere, atmospheric pressure. If we have an area of low pressure over a part of the sea, there's less weight of air pushing down onto the uh, sea surface, so it allows the sea to rise, and it can rise considerable amounts, meters. The hurricane winds were forced across Scotland, flattening forests as they headed for the east coast. That combination of wind, waves and pressure created this century's worst storm surge. It was three hours since the Princess Victoria had foundered. Now the storm had reached Hunstanton in Norfolk. In 1953, there were 10,000 American servicemen stationed in Britain. One of them was Corporal Rice Lemming. The coming night would make him a hero, and as it has done for all the survivors, mark him forever. Remember, one pound is not one dollar, but four dollars. The Americans' role in 50s Britain was a supporting one. 
As the weather closed in on that January afternoon, they had no idea that their next enemy would be the sea. It was four or five o'clock in the afternoon when the wind really started picking up. It was blowing over 100 miles an hour at the barracks. I was concerned that if the aircraft were secure, the wind by then was blowing so hard that the B-29s were bouncing virtually on the wheels and uh, the props were starting to go around and so we got a couple more trucks out of the hangar and drove the two trucks under the wings of the aircraft and we secured both uh, aircraft that way. Ten miles away, never giving a thought to the sea at the bottom end of South Beach Road, Hunstanton, Betty Quincy was organizing a birthday party. At the last moment, she decided to cancel, with tragic consequences. On that day, my daughter was six, and we was going to have a birthday party. I'd got the cake all organised, and obviously all the children down that area was coming. And because I cancelled it, nobody came, so of course most of them got drowned. As we got back to the barracks, the alert officer had received a call from Hunstanton, from the constabulary here, I guess, uh, who said that uh, the water had exceeded the seawall and uh, there were a lot of people in, in peril and would we come out and assist in the flood? First thing when I knew we was really going to be in trouble was when my floor kept going down and coming up. I started walking through the water down that road. It was January in the North Sea and the water was extremely cold. I came to the first house and I could hear some children screaming. I told the children that the tide would go down and then people could get to us. I told them to sit in the, the two armchairs against the fireplace and they just kept there. There was nothing we could do, nothing we could have. I got around the side of the house and sure enough, there were on top of the second story of this building, two children and two adults. When the dinghy got to us, we just sort of slipped and slid down into the dinghy. And I finally got them in the boat and carried them out, you know, if I hang on to the rest, carried them out down to the end of that street and took them to help. That's what I did the rest of the night. Betty's house was at the top end of South Beach Road, farthest from the sea. For her friends and neighbors lower down, Rice Lemming's heroic efforts came too late. Obviously, I didn't realize people had been drowned. It's only the next morning when you realize how really bad it was. Betty and her family survived, but she lost 11 of her close friends and neighbors, including all the children who would have been at Susan's birthday party. Angela was obviously washed away with her mum, and um, Patmuth's, the smaller ones, was gone, and the stubborns was gone. Of course, Ethel and uh, Mrs. Coates went as well, Mrs. Driver. More than 300 names are recorded on memorials like this in seaside communities from Yorkshire to Essex. They were mums and dads to me, Mr. and Mrs. Driver, Mrs. Coates, Miss Sethel. It was like losing mum and dad. In Hunstanton, the death toll would have been higher had it not been for the unceasing efforts of Rice Lemming. He spent 12 hours in the freezing water, dragging his inflatable dinghy, searching for survivors. He rescued 27 people that night and was awarded the George Medal for Bravery by the young Queen Elizabeth. Today, it's the children that he could not save that haunt him. I remember one time I had so many people in the raft that, that I was really concerned about would I could even get them back. Forty five years you gotta get over this. I don't like that siren going up to say the the water's high. It just brings it all back. For the people of Hunstanton, the worst was past, but the sea was still rising to the south. Late on Saturday night, it reached the record height of eight meters and attacked the coast on two fronts, East Anglia and the low-lying Dutch coast, 130 miles away across the North Sea. 
For Dick Cease, aged only six at the time, it was a night that would change the course of his life. Don't you see Lucas, my mother? Simon sees my father. Before Sunday dawned, 1,800 people would be dead, and he would be an orphan. Cromarty 4, Tyne Dogger. The low pressure that had led to the deaths of more than 300 people in Britain was now trapped in the funnel of the North Sea. Onshore winds drove the highest tide in recorded history towards the coast of Holland. The fields and villages here are below sea level, protected by dikes, for these flat islands have been reclaimed from the North Sea. Now, the sea was about to return. Dick Cease lived right by the coast. My heelweinig. At that time, I was just six years old. That Saturday, it was windy, I remember that. But I was so young, and I went to bed and slept. My uncle came and said, you have to leave because the water is getting higher. I'll take you with me, your sister and you. My father and my mother stayed at home with my other sister. My mother was pregnant and she didn't dare go into the water. I think that's why they didn't leave. She was thinking about the new life she was carrying and she didn't want to risk that. My uncle took me on his shoulders and there was another man who took my sister on his shoulders. And we walked through the water to Neukirk which was considerably higher than where we were. As the dikes crumbled, only Dick, his sister and uncle escaped. The rest of the family remained trapped in the attic as the sea continued to rise. I thought, now they can't get here, they will probably be in the attic and would wait for the water to go down. But they never came. I waited for two or three months before I heard that they were drowned, along with my youngest sister. It took such a long time, and all that time you don't know what has happened. Will they come or not? It was a very difficult period in my life, the uncertainty. And I never saw them again. Seven members of his family were swept away that night. The bodies of some of them were never recovered. They rang the bells to warn people what was coming. More than 100,000 were safely evacuated that night, but for many, the warning came too late. There was no time to evacuate Uda Tong. A mass grave is a constant reminder of that night's terror. As the water reached a height of three and a half meters in just a few hours, there was no chance to escape to higher ground. For Johannes Loss and his family, there was no warning. We went to bed as usual. My wife was sleeping badly because she was eight months pregnant. In the middle of the night, she got out of bed, she put on the light, and outside she saw the foam on the water. But she didn't realize it was water. She thought it had been snowing. The Loos family sat in their attic and waited, praying for the water to go down. What they did not know was the pressure of the waves had undermined the house itself. And, uh, Suddenly, the front outside wall was just swept away. Then the floor gave way, and my father was swept outside, followed by my sister, and then my other daughter, the oldest one. My wife and my second daughter fell into a cot. I grabbed it and managed to pull them back into the attic. Then everything calmed down. There was less wind, but everywhere there was water. It was silent. We sat there until two o'clock on Monday afternoon. Johannes was never to see his sister, his father, or his eldest daughter again. The storm surge smashed at least 80 breaches in Holland's dikes that night. 
some up to 600 feet wide. By the end of the day, only 85 deaths had been reported. It was many more weeks before the true death toll would be revealed to a stunned world. You're numbed by such an event. When you see three people drown before your very eyes, you're bound to be numb. I found my daughter myself. That was nine weeks after the flood. She was in a ditch and her arm was sticking out of the mud. I recognized her clothes. Eleven weeks later, they found my father. Johanna's sister's body was never identified. He hopes she was found and now lies in one of the unmarked graves. Oberkent Meischer, unknown woman. 1,835 people died in Holland that weekend. In Zirikzee, a memorial monument of a pregnant woman and child stands in defiance at the head of the estuary. It is a fitting tribute to those who died and reminds the world of how determined the Dutch are that they will never suffer such a fate again. The Dutch have built their country themselves. They've built it up from the delta uh, of the Rhine. They've built it up from the marshlands. Without strong defenses, there would be no Holland. Within the national psyche, I imagine, there is this inbuilt uh, idea of the, the boy with the finger in the dike. In fact, they have a law which states this is the shape of the coast in 1991 and we will protect this coast to this line forevermore. It was too late to protect southeast England. Now the low pressure was settled off Essex. The storm was about to cause a final tragedy, one that could have been avoided. For it was now 12 hours since the storm surge had claimed its first victim, 12 hours since Rice Lemming had embarked on his heroic rescue in Norfolk. The people of Canvey Island could have been warned and evacuated. It won't burn. The Mansers were a family of 11. They had been bombed out of London twice and were living in a tiny wooden cottage. It had been a typical Saturday evening. The younger children were at home listening to the radio and the elder three brothers had been to the cinema. I can remember that it was very, very windy. The wind was blowing across the, the path and uh, we were having to be a little bit careful. I think they must have been about 9.30 or something. I was quite excited because it had been a quite a good film, you know. And then I, we, we had a chat with my mother and father, sort of thing, uh, told them about the film, and my um, dad said, like, going off to bed, and that was it, went to bed. I was woken up from around about one o'clock in the morning by our dog barking and raising alarm in a very agitated manner, and my arm sort of fell out of bed, and it was a shock of cold water suddenly coming into my bed. The bed was soaking wet, and as I stepped out, I was up to my thighs in water, and it was climbing. And we sort of rushed round to the living area, and my father was scrabbling on top of his table, trying to rip the ceiling down. And he pummeled a hole in the asbestos roof above his head, and then he decided that he would pass the children up one at a time, for them to sit across the rafters that span the living room. We didn't have night clothes, so we were sort of sitting there with very little on on the rafters. I was cold. Hungry, extremely tired, because if you knew that if you fell asleep, you were going to die. You were going to fall off and you were going to die. There's no doubt about that at all. So you hung on to grim death. From a seven-year-old's point of view, one of the most fascinating things was watching the furniture floating around. I think my mother and father kept our spirits up because they kept on saying, come on, how about that? Jesus wants me for a sunbeam. For a sunbeam, Jesus wants me for a sunbeam. And we must have sung for a couple of hours. Um, and then it gradually tailed off and we got, uh, I think, uh, I think we must got a little bit sleepy but, um, because it had been quiet for about 15 or 20 minutes. And then suddenly I heard this, just this crack, 
crack and a great big whoosh of water. My younger brother, Keith, went into the water. So I dropped down from the rafters and grabbed him and the water was up to my chest. And he was obviously younger than me, so he was shorter. He got older, Keith, but uh, I mean, there was nothing you could do. Keith was still gurgling a little bit, but he just, uh, his, the gurgle turned, to, just became silent. I realised I'd been standing in cold water for something like 10 hours, holding my younger brother. While Chris held on to Keith for the rest of the night, his mother clutched the two babies in the pram and his father clung on to the other five perched perilously on the rafters. I can remember my mother saying to my father, the children had stopped crying in the pram. I think they, must, they, they might be dead. And my father saying, no, Anne, uh, they're probably just asleep. As dawn broke, a rescue boat arrived but it came too late for the three youngest brothers, Keith, Gordon and Alan. If you mentioned the Canby of Thus to my mother, she would just burst into tears and, no, we don't want to talk about it. It ruined their lives, quite honestly. I mean, um, my mother and father never told us where the children were buried. We had to find that out after they died. I can't forget it. I mean, it breaks my heart even now, today, to just thinking about it, because it was just a sad waste of life. If I see a great expanse of sea, it gives me a terrible feeling inside. Well, I can't do, and I can't do it to this day, and that is stay up my depth and water. I don't blame the sea at all. I don't blame anybody. It was just a natural disaster that happened. There's a kind of anger, a kind of anger against nature and the elements. That's the only time that I'm happy, is when I've got the wind in the face and I'm, I'm cheating nature, because she cheated me. Canvey Island was completely flooded and the entire population was evacuated. The coming of the tide had left thousands of people homeless and another 58 dead. The tragic events of that far off night are all but forgotten, but one day, that fatal combination of weather and tide will come again, cruel and unstoppable. Homes will be devastated, families broken once again. Today, more and more people are choosing to live and work close to the sea, within the power of the fatal tide. Next week on Savage Planet, life and death in the hottest valley on Earth. If you would like a copy of our booklet, send a cheque or postal order for £1.50, payable to Savage Planet, P.O. Box 3000, Manchester, M60, 